good evening to all of you and welcome uh, to this uh, session tonight. Uh, we very much appreciate your presence and uh, jointly we are going to talk about the net zero pathways. Uh, and the whole challenge here is to move from aspiration and commitments to action and results. And that's what we'd like to focus the discussion on. So let me uh, bring a little bit of context to that. Um, many countries obviously uh, are submitting enhanced uh, 2030 NDCs to the UN FCCC ahead of uh, COP26 in Glasgow. And uh, I think there's a general re recognition of the urgency for climate action. In support of the long-term goal, 121 countries have now pledged to reach net zero carbon emission by 2050, or around then. And many of these are stepping up their 2030 plans to align with this target. And yet, for this to happen, deep and unprecedented, really, transformations are needed in each one of the key systems that enable life on Earth, at least for humans, uh, as we know it, right? Uh, so in the power sector, you know, six-fold increase in renewable energy penetration by 2030 will be required and accompanied by a five-fold growth in the phasing out uh, of unabated coal, in the phasing out of the rate of unabated coal. So that's a very substantial change we're talking about. Uh, in the built uh, environment, all actors will need to step up decarbonization uh, by a factor of five, uh, while the rate of adoption of electric vehicles will need to increase 12 times by 2030. Uh, in the area of uh, forestry, tree cover gains will need to increase five times, and deforestation will have to come to a complete halt also by 2030. Uh, and when it comes to soils, uh, a significant regeneration of organic content in soils will be necessary for agricultural productivity to keep up with uh, rapid population growth. And it will need to be coupled with substantial changes in dietary and consumption patterns. So, um, Thank you so much, uh, and um, technology is the solution and sometimes the problem, right? So um, the challenge I was saying is fairly daunting when you declinate it into some of these quantitative um, uh, uh, magnitude of change that, that we need. And uh, uh, so the next question really is, what does it, this mean in practice for any specific country? How do you move from uh, global to local level into net zero targets successfully, and what are the challenges and the opportunities that this process comes along with? Uh, so in this event, we are very fortunate to have a number of uh, very well-placed colleagues uh, who can help us address those issues and share their uh, national experience. Uh, we thought we would start with science uh, because a summary here is in order. And uh, we're very happy to have uh, Pierce Foster uh, to be with us uh, today to sort of do the, uh, the, 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 the initial setting of our conversation. Professor Pierce Foster, many of you know, and if you don't know him, you know his publications for sure. He has played leading roles authoring intergovernmental panel on climate change reports, IPCC reports, including acting as a lead author for the IPCC special report on the 1.5 degree and coordinating, uh, being the coordinating lead author for the IPCC 6 assessment report published in August of this year. Um, he is the founding director of the Priestley International Center for Climate at the University of Leeds. And uh, the Priestley Center is dedicated to research and innovation on interdisciplinary inter climate solutions. As professor of physical climate change, he researches the causes of climate change. He is a scientist, climate impacts and mitigation strategies. And he has sat on the UK government's climate change committee since 2018, acting as independent advisor to the UK government on its climate target. So Piers, please, um, we're 
uh, expecting to hear from science. Well, it's fantastic to be here this afternoon, and I think we're all doing very well and can, can, can welcome you to the United Kingdom as well. Um, okay, yeah, I thought I would just, just, just begin with this little film from Canada that was taken earlier this year, in fact, when the temperatures got up to nearly kind of kind of 50 degrees and there were a lot of people kind of kind of kind of died from the burning kind of town uh, uh, and this was a extreme of kind of climate that is being felt today and this isn't in a developing country this is in one of the world's most developed countries uh, and it is really it, 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 it is it is it is really affecting everyone every, every everywhere um so yeah uh, uh, and this is the temperature rise of 1.2 degrees so we aren't even at that 1.5 degree target uh, 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 and our report was quite obvious that uh, the extreme will get worse if the temperature continue to go up and up uh, and particularly the heat the 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 heat the heat the the heat waves intense rainfall and the drought changes will all will all accelerate um uh, and that isn't the kind of worst of everything that there are some changes that are today irreversible and this even if we get to our net zero targets and are able to stabilize the surface, surface temperature, some effects will continue. And, uh, but, uh, 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 and there are the possibilities of perhaps very high levels of surface temperature, temperature change and coupled to that potentially several meters of sea level rise that occur after 2100 and uh, but, but I want you to get from this picture behind me that it's not the the these devastating effects we do see up here that are possible they aren't necessarily going to occur because they depend on our actions as a society going further forward from where we are today. So, so if you look at the curve behind me, we really have the, the options to try and take the kind of bottom curves to keep temperatures toward one and a half degrees, We're kind of where we expect these abrupt changes might not occur, but if we, as soon as we go above that, things will get a lot worse. So it's up to us to plot that pathway from where we are today. Um, uh, yeah, and this just says that really, if we want to have those more positive out outcomes and end up something near 1.5 degrees, we not only have to get to our net zero targets, we have to have chosen rapid and sustained reductions in emissions from where we are today, and it has to begin instantly, of course. Uh, um, but, but, but things have started to alter and things have started to kind of, kind of change in fact. If you looked at the direction of travel where we were going back in 2010, we were probably heading for three and a half, kind of, kind of four degrees of surface temperature change but that isn't where we are today. If you do look at where we are today, we're perhaps around 2.8 degrees with current kind of policies. Uh, 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 and if you look at the latest report from the Climate Action Tracker website or the UNEP GAP report, it, 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 
if countries deliver on both the NDC targets and also on their net zero targets, we might end up closer to two degrees and perhaps, yeah, just with all the targets today, we might even end up just below two, you know. So, so, so that would be fantastic. But, but, of, but of course, this COP is not about setting the targets, it's about delivering on their targets. Uh, um, uh, uh, and just as was, just as was gonna said so eloquently in your introduction, the, the, the solutions to those net zero goals are all quite similar. We have to improve our energy efficiency of course, and we have to reduce our energy demands. We have to have lots of renewable energy. We have to electrify our economies as much as possible, and we have to change agriculture and land use from being a net source of greenhouse gases into a big net sink of greenhouse gases. Um, but, 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 so the solution we need to get to are all very similar for the different countries uh, and they can bring lots of good co-benefit co for new job opportunities, the kind of, the kind of health and our wealth of our societies. But, Although the solutions are different, the delivery of those solutions will be different in every country, and we have to re really worry not only on where we end up, we have to worry about the transition to where we end up, and the transitional risk involved with that, uh, and we have to, uh, we have to, uh, do we have to adapt ourselves, of course, too, to the extremes and things that will continue to get worse. So whatever we put in for our net zero infrastructure will have to be resilient. Uh, um, yeah, uh, and this was a really nice plot I put in for the current state of climate action. And this, this this diagram does really indicate what we have to do over the next decade to accelerate the, del the delivery of all the things we talked about, like the number of electric cars, the, the rate of building with wind turbines and all the other things we have to do. And this will have to be the decade of that rapid acceleration. Uh, um, I'm not a kind of finance expert at all, but I sit on the UK government committee that does have to deal with this. Uh, and I thought I'd give you one example where from our own country for the net zero pathways, where we have a net zero strategy in the, in the UK, and we have gone through and kind of cost of that and of course it takes a big upfront capital in investment in things like the car charging the building infrastructure and doing the carbon capture and removals but, but but at the same time of that capital expense which is nowhere near what we spent on the COVID-19 pandemic the, we do get significant operating cost savings to come in over time by producing ch cheap electricity and these other things. So, uh, 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 and what this diagram doesn't have on it, of course, is the extra financial benefit you, you get by not increasing the surface temperatures, but because it, if we don't have to, if we can build a more resilient society, we won't be so 
so influenced and affected by all the extremes we might experience. Uh, yeah, yeah, okay. So what I want to try and get over you to you guys today is that we do have to begin this net zero journey, uh, and, and the net zero journey will be it is achievable, and it won't cost too much. So we have to get on there, and we have to del del deliver it. So I'm really interested in kind of finding out from what are, what you think the solutions are for your individual countries. Thank you very much, Professor Pierce Foster. You certainly have shared with us the, the hard lessons of uh, science here, and uh, we're suddenly past the point of um, uh, having any space for doubt on this. Uh, we, I will retain also that you did give us some hope here. Uh, I mean, I heard you say, I think that with a decade of uh, rapid acceleration, and if we take seriously, both the NDC targets and the net zero targets, we could, even if we miss the 1.5 degree target, uh, be in uh, a sporting chance with the two degree, right? So uh, that's, the, that's the context, and I think it brings us back, straight back to implementation here, because uh, we know that uh, it is very difficult to get to that um, uh, collective action. So uh, let me, maybe, I, I know you may want to ask uh, questions from um, Professor Pierce Forster. We'll have a chance later, but I um, know that our second speaker, Damilola Agumbi, has to leave us. Uh, we're privileged to have you tonight, and so well, maybe we'll take a chance for question after her uh, intervention. So um, please join us on stage. Thank you. Damilola Agumbiji is the CEO of Sustainable Energy for All uh, and also the special representative of the UN Secretary General for Sustainable Energy for All and co-chair of UN Energy. Uh, she's also a commissioner for the Global Commission to End Energy Poverty and the co-chair of the COP26 Energy Transition Council, uh, which plays an increasing role. She's a global leader and advocate for the achievement of Sustainable Development Goal 7, uh, which calls for access to reliable, affordable, sustainable, and modern energy for all by 2030, uh, in line with the Paris Agreement on Climate Change. And prior to joining uh, Sustainable Energy for All, she was the first female managing director of the Nigerian Rural Electrification Agency, uh, which is uh, quite a set of, of uh, achievements. So, um, Demi Lola, uh, with this uh, uh, incredible uh, background and experience, uh, we're very interested in hearing your views on the energy sector. I wouldn't ask questions about anything else at this point. Uh, the energy sector remains the largest con contributor to global emissions. Virtually all countries have included energy generation, energy efficiency, and access uh, within their national NDCs and decarbonization strategies. Can you elaborate on the type of systemic transformations that are required in the energy sector to achieve net zero? And what type of support is most needed from financial mechanism such as us, the Jeff, right? Um, so thank you very much for having me. I'm not going to go delve into the science because I think Professor Foster did a really great job on what we have to do. And, and I also believe that if you didn't believe we needed to get to net zero, none of you will be here today. I want to take a different angle on energy. Um, a lot of the presentations and a lot of things we've seen today has been focused on how we're going to reduce energy. And I want to focus on the billion people who don't have energy and are actually in energy poverty as we speak. So today in the world, we have 759 million people who have no access to electricity at all. So they can't be here, they can't live stream, they can't do all those nice things. And we have 2.6 billion people that have no access to clean cooking. And these are people you can't stay, just stay at home. So while we, we focused on reduction, there's also another energy story. And that is the story of energy access. And it has to be part of the transition story. So yesterday we had President Modi 
um, with his net zero 2070 um, agree, um, conversation, which really means they are going to get out of coal. We had my president today, Nigeria, saying they're going to have a 2060 target. Um, if you don't know Nigeria, it's the largest oil and gas nation responsible for 90% of GDP, oil and gas. So that's huge. And the discussion we'll be having today is how do we help those countries reach those targets, right? Because the developed world knows what to do, if we're going to be perfectly honest. And they always seem to find money in six months, 15 trillion for COVID when there is no money. Um, but the developing world needs help. So back to an example of my country, Nigeria would need something about 400 billion above business as usual spending to get anywhere near net zero by 2060. Where's that money gonna come from? How do you explain that this is beyond the power system? You're electrifying the whole economy. So that's transport, agriculture, waste. You're actually getting a different way of thinking. So it's beyond car charging points, right? It's even getting people to think of electric cars being viable and have enough electricity to, to even live. So what I wanted to bring on the table is that we know we have to transform our energy systems in the developed world. We also know in the emerging economies, but the developing countries are very key because you have people that can still go dirty. Like just because there's no these big coal-fired power plants in some of these regions doesn't mean they can't come if they can't find anything um, different. And I just wanted to you know, plead with your organization as well that when we think about climate and we think about climate mitigation, there's no bigger mitigation than giving people cleaner energy to start off with. So they're not even thinking about transitioning. And that's where we really have to come to as a society. We have to focus on giving clean energy to start, clean energy for industry, clean energy for gender, clean energy for economic growth, which is not the barest level of energy access all the time. So we're not coming back to these countries in 20 years time and spending 10x the amount of money getting them to transition. Um, so thank you for having me. I hope I bring another context into the conversation. And I, I'm sorry I have to leave, but really welcome you guys getting in touch with us with Sustainable Energy for All if you'd like to know anything more about what we do. Thank you very much. Thank you very, very much, uh, Damilola. Uh, and we will retain your message that uh, uh, it is about people who don't have energy and it is about starting with clean energy for those uh, as part of the equitable solution that we need to solve this uh, global problem. Thank you so much for joining us in, in spite of uh, the, the time pressure. And um, uh, thanks very much uh, uh, to Professor uh, Peace Proster for making space as well. Professor, would you like to join us a few minutes to take questions from the audience while we have this first part of our conversation still, um, still clear? I thought she was very good. You wanted to ask her questions more. Uh, ha, ha. Uh, so, any questions uh, for the professor? He insisted that he would welcome questions, so I encourage you. Um. All right. I think he was he was extremely clear. And uh, as uh, uh, Damilola said, I mean, probably you are all past the stage of having questions about the science of this, in fact, right? Because we all know that it's about the implementation and how do we get to make it work. So let me invite, uh, in that case, our next speakers. Thank you very much. Don't, what ever, kind of, don't ever forget about the science, though, guys. We still have to do uh, well, what I would say, that, that it can really support the transition. It, it, can, it can really try and make sure that you have those, res those resilient infrastructures and you do take the best options for your particular country. So, so I think it's good. Excellent, prof Excellent, Professor, and thanks very much for your contribution. Uh, the, the reports that you have authored and co-authored certainly have contributed massively to get us to consensus on, on science itself, so uh, thanks very much. And let us move to the second part of this uh, conversation tonight, where we have the pleasure of being joined by three ministers and vice ministers who I'm now inviting to join us uh, on uh, 
uh, on the stage, uh, starting with um, Minister Simon Steele, uh, Minister of Climate, Resilience and Environment of Grenada. Oh, Minister, good evening and thanks very much for joining us. Uh, I will also call on stage uh, um, Minister Andrea Meza, who's the Minister of Environment and Energy for Costa Rica. Thanks for joining us, Minister Meza. And I will invite uh, Minister Nicolas Galarza Sanchez, who's the Deputy Minister for Environment and Sustainable Development in Colombia. Uh, Vice Minister, join us. Thank you very much. Um, so this is our, uh, the second part of our discussion tonight, and it has very much to do with the actual national level of intervention with which we hope to get to the objectives discussed. So um, let me start uh, here with uh, Minister Simon Steele. Um, Minister Simon Steele is Grenada's Minister for Climate Resilience and the Environment, as I announced, and he previously served as Minister of Education and Human Resource Development, uh, uh, Minister of State with responsibility for human resource development and the environment, and as a parliamentary secretary within the Ministry of Agriculture, Lands, Forestry, and Fisheries. At the time when we're talking about integration, this, is, this carries a lot of relevance. Uh, Minister Steele is also a member of Grenada's Upper House of Parliament, the Senate, where he currently serves as a leader of government business. Prior to his return to Grenada, uh, Minister Simon Steele had a successful career spanning some 14 years within the technology sector, holding senior executive positions in a number of industry leading companies, from Silicon Valley uh, technology startup to major corporations. Uh, and uh, he also brings that technological and private sector experience to uh, the discussion, which is invaluable. Minister Steele originally trained as an engineer and holds a Master of Business Administration from the University of Westminster in the United Kingdom. So Minister, welcome. We're very happy to have you tonight. Thank you. And let me follow up with questions. Um, so Grenada submitted its second NDC in November 2020, uh, adopting an ambitious target of 40% reduction uh, on 2010 levels by 2030. Um, this is broadly in line with the IPCC report on 1.5 degrees. So we congratulate you on this. Can you tell us about the process you used to come up with the new NDC? What bottlenecks did you face and how did you go about overcoming them for this very good commitment? Thank you. And what's it? often I, I'm losing track of what time of day or night um, it is, but it's, um, it's wonderful to, to be part of this. Um, the, the first thing I want to say, again, to give some, some context, a 40% reduction by 2030, um, on the surface does not sound as ambitious as it could be for a small island developing state. And I just wanted to give a slight context to that. Our starting point is a very, very low point of just 1% penetration in re renewable energy. Grenada has had challenges um, for many years in its utility sector with um, the ownership of its, um, the, the utility which was partially um, privatized. And we have only recently overcome legal and commercial um, obstacles mm -hmm. to be able to take charge of that utility and now apply the measures, pr provide the regulatory environment um, and the incentive environment now for the proliferation of, of renewables. Um, so that's the, the, the context. Within that context, um, Grenada submitted its enhanced NDC. Um, we were the second within the region to submit at the end of, of, of last year. And that was a process that started in, um, in 2018. Um, it was a highly inclusive process we took, uh, all of government, all of society um, approach to it, significant consultations um, at a sectoral level, but also with key stakeholders, um, private sector, civil society. Um, and this was done with support through the NDC partnership. Some of the challenges that, that we faced, um, a, a, a very common one, um, certainly for us in the Caribbean, which is 
capacity, um, the human resources, the technical um, resources, skill sets to enable us um, specifically with some of the scenario modeling um, work um, in terms of looking at the um, emission characteristics and reductions and, and the planning. Um, but support was available through, um, through the NDC partnership to assist there. But we also used as many local consultants as possible. So this is a country-owned process. And part of this included capacity building for our teams um, on the ground. So bottleneck was, 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 was capacity. Um, the most significant bottleneck, though, is actually going to be on not developing the NDC. It is implementing it. The value for a small island development state, a population of 100,000, is 1.1 billion US dollars. So the question is, how do we finance that? We have a great plan, and we're working with some great partners. Um, in addition to the targets set within the, um, within the NDC, we're also working with UN Environment, um, Rocky Mountain Institute, looking at how we can accelerate um, elements, um, certainly on the energy, um, energy piece. The other areas covered are transport, waste, forests, and industrial processes, which are, which are negligible cooling um, processes. Um, so the greatest challenge and the greatest inhibitor for us is going to be how do we actually turn this piece of paper into real action? And that is where support from our donors, our development partners is so critical, and we're here at COP, and the pressure that is on developed nations to deliver on that $100 billion and um, ease of access to that um, is, is central to that. Thank you very much, uh, Minister, and I very much retain what you said about inclusion as, as, um, uh, as a vector of positive change, right? And capacity constraint as, as one of the main challenge here. Um, it's very interesting for us to have through you the perspective of uh, a small island country or a large ocean nations because it comes together. Uh, but we're very interested here uh, in uh, having your views as part of uh, that perspective, um, which uh, on, on a challenge that is that all islands share, right? They, they have very small carbon footprint when compared to global carbon emissions, and yet uh, they are supposed to be ones suffering the most from some of the adverse climate impact. So where do you see synergies between climate mitigation and climate adaptation and um, vulnerability objectives? Can net zero strategies also bring um, Adaptation gains, where do you see the, 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 the potential uh, challenge or the potential benefit here? Hmm. Well, one of the approaches that we've taken um, in Grenada is an integrate, a programmatic approach mm -hmm. um, to our resilience building. And that gives us an opportunity to blend adaptation and mitigation um, projects within um, within a, 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 an integrated program, and that helps identify where those synergies um, those synergies exist. And if we look in some, some very practical terms, whether it is coral reef restoration, which um, uh, in, in, in terms of um, protected, uh, I'll add corals and mangroves. So the uh, the uh, carbon capture benefits um, that are, whether it's from a healthy ocean, whether it is from, um, from reforesting, um, but then in terms of protecting our shorelines, and we know how critical um, healthy coral reefs and mangroves are for the protection of our, um, our uh, coastal areas with um, the impacts of sea level rise, storm surges, um, et cetera. Um, whether it's land use, forestry, reforestation, which again, in terms of carbon capture, but in addition um, to that, in terms of protecting our watersheds and supporting water security, where water scarcity um, is, is becoming such an issue with increased drought conditions. The area of um, agriculture and climate 
agriculture, um, climate smart agricultural practices, which enable us to adapt to the changing conditions, um, supporting our efforts to improve food security, but also practices that are environmentally um, sustainable and, 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 and conscious. And I guess the, the, the area of um, where this energy transition, um, again, the, the, what we're looking at right now with renewable energy uh, uh, networks is how we can inbuild through having a distributed network um, inbuilt resilience from hurricanes, et cetera, our ability to withstand and recover faster. But in addition to providing that level of res resilience, again, the, um, the, uh, the transition away from fossil fuels and the benefits that that, that, that that brings. So when you look sector by sector, there are clear benefits, clear crossovers, um, and taking advantage of those synergies um, increases, again, with limited resources, the more that we're able to synergize, um, the far better for us. Thank you very much, uh, Minister. A very interesting answer around um, having, having a thoughtful and programmatic approach to resilience, where you look for these synergies, essentially, right? Uh, and, uh, and there are many, as per the list you just provided us with, uh, when you think about it, I mean, there are many, and they are, have to be part of all of our plans. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll um, uh, keep you for further questions, if that's, uh, if that's uh, um, uh, agreeable. And let me turn to Minister Andrea Meza, who's the Minister of Environment and Energy for Costa Rica. Um, Minister Meza is an expert in sustainable development with more than 20 years of experience in formulating public policies and executing projects. She has worked in more than 15 Latin American countries in multidisciplinary projects financed by various multilateral organizations, IDB, the World Bank, CAF, European Union, UNDP, uh, or bilateral, I see then GIS and uh, national governments. So, uh, Minister Menza, uh, you are now leading the environment and energy sector for one of the countries with the most uh, spectacular track record. And uh, we're um, very interested in hearing more about your experience. So, Costa Rica is seen as a, as a global leader, and uh, it uh, comes to transitioning to a low carbon economy. This is partly thanks to the large uh, natural endowment that the country has, including large uh, hydroelectric generation capacity. But this is also and maybe mainly due to a coordinated effort to halt and reverse deforestation, um, move to a, a virtually 100% carbon free electricity mix and invest in low carbon mobility. So Costa Rica's long term decarbonization plan can be an example for many other forest-rich developing countries. Can you tell us about the key features of the plan and particularly about uh, what is relevant to other countries to consider, adopt, and promote? Thank you, and I'm so excited and honored to be sharing the panel with my friend and friends here. Um, and uh, with the decarbonization plan is basically our long-term strategy. And, um, and as the professor was saying, for us, it was also very important to recognize that we need the commitment to be zero emissions in 2050. So we developed the plan, and we are realized that it is to transform the whole economy. It's about that. It's not only one sector. It's about seeing the different pathways in that, in powering, in transport, in waste management, in agriculture, and nature-based solutions. So it's it was really seeing, okay, what are the aspects that we need to transform if we want to have this goal achieve and be carbon neutral in 2050? And um, in the case of Costa Rica, yes, we have stopped deforestation, but we still are generating emissions from agriculture. And still we know that if we don't maintain um, these policies to protect nature, then deforestation can start again. So it's, okay, this is something that we need to maintain. Yes, we generate our electricity from renewables, 
but we're still using a lot of fossil fuels in the transport sector. So it's about electrifying the transport sector. And it's about what is the industry using. It's about electrifying the industry. So we are developing these and understanding then when we have a long-term vision, it doesn't mean that we are postponing our decisions. We need to start now. So the in the plan, we have short-term, medium-term, and long-term measures. And this is very critical to understand because sometimes when we hear that we have long-term plans, some people think, oh, you are postponing your decisions. And that's really far from the reality. And this is the decisive decade. This is what we're saying. It's about really accelerating uh, the adoption of these new technologies. And it's an understanding also What's the benefit, the economic benefit of this, the social benefits of all these measures? So we also made a cost-benefit analysis. And at the end, this is also good for our economy. We generate benefits of mo for more than $40 billion for the economy. So it's about, it's about understanding that this is not an environmental issue, that this is an economic issue that we can be generating jobs and also we're doing right now some analysis to understand where, which, in which sectors we will be generating jobs. Yes, we can be losing jobs in some areas and, and we need to understand that that we need then to address a just transition. And I will say that um, it's about understanding that this is a development model and that's why we are working with this whole of a government approach as well and whole of society as approach as well. And we bring this idea of, okay, which is the kind of direct investment that we want to bring to the country? The one that it is aligned with these aspects. Which are the kind of investments? We can be prioritizing investments that are aligned with Paris Agreement. And it's about understanding that. Yes, cooperation is critical, but will never be enough. <laughs> the 100 billion will never be enough to, we need to mobilize trillions of dollars. This is about that, and we will be mobilizing public and private money, it's, and it's about understanding also that and generating the enabling conditions for this mobilization of public and private resources. So it's about, I think with cooperation money normally, and we are doing this, for example, in the transport sector with uh, pilot in e-mobility in e with e-buses, understanding the data uh, that this is good for, for the operators and they are seeing uh, that it is good for their, for their economy and then developing the model so they can do the scale up of this pilot. So normally what we see is that with the cooperation money we do the piloting, but then we need to mobilize real investments, public and private money for that. And it's, I think it's also understanding that it's about generating the good um, environment for those investments. Thank you very much, uh, Minister. And thanks for telling us, I, I, I very much like that, that the uh, decarbonization plan is the strategy. It's not a strategy. It is the national strategy, right? Um, and also to um, to have this uh, sobering word of warning that, you know, good balances are never uh, there forever. They have to be maintained, right? Uh, we s reversals are possible uh, and uh, doing the right thing ever after requires keeping watch on, on policy, on investment, on priorities as you just shared, right? Now, um, let me follow up with a second question because we are, um, uh, many countries look at what Costa Rica is doing and would very much want to do the same, right? We understand there are, uh, there's, a, there's a difficult path to that kind of achievement. So what were the key challenges in preparing this decarbonization plan? And, and, and most importantly, what, what, what were the lessons that can be extracted in terms of receiving adequate support from institutions like ours, right? Um, this is to help us actually adapt part of our uh, support uh, as a function of what you have experienced along this way. Where do you think public climate finance resources can be best invested to collaborate uh, with countries uh, with their strategy to obtain maximum results. Yeah. What are your uh, advices to us? Yeah. Mm -hmm. First is to really understand that Costa Rica is like a, it's, it's a common country. We're not so different from Grenada or Colombia. I mean, we all face similar challenges because sometimes 
I hear that, oh, Costa Rica is doing this and the leader. I mean, we're, we have a very small fiscal space. Right. To facing a lot of the same problems that, I mean, probably if I share with my Colombian partner, we will be saying, yes, we're facing the same problems. So it's really to understand that at the end, it's a country that it is, I will say, committed and clear about policy implementation. And, and probably this is the element that when we define uh, the model, then you normally take these as as a national policy, and no matter if the government changes, then you will man maintain that. And I think that this is this is important. When we were developing the the decarbonization plan, and um, we were also struggling with capacities, and we were saying, okay, we need a lot of modeling for doing this. What, which are the right pathways? And um, we were discussing and talking with the different partners, and um, then we identified, okay, we want to bring this technology, but we want to generate capacity in the country as well. So we also established local um, teams. We worked with the university, and now we have the capacity, and it's the, the national university that is generating a lot of this modeling of the energy sector and the economics, and, and I think that this is one part which is so important if we want to really generate policies based on science, <laughs> that we have the capacities of doing modeling in, in our countries and, and robust data. And then uh, the other aspect right now, and I will say the other big challenge is normally there are a lot of good ideas, but normally it's very hard to develop projects and bankable projects, which is really normally uh, a big challenge in our country. So it's about, we really need to implement and generate more capacities to generate bankable projects. And, and I will say that probably these are two critical aspects that we need to support in, in the different countries mm -hmm. coming from our experience. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Um, so there's no magic bullet or magic country here, right? It's a, it's a hard work of setting the policies, a hard work of um, working on capacities. You wanted to react. Yeah. You, please. Um. Be it's, it was actually remiss of me not to mention that we're actually working with Costa Rica. I mentioned UNEP, I mentioned Rocky Mountain Institute, but we're also working with Costa Rica using the lessons of their experience. And I think that this could be a wonderful example, a model of how we can cooperate, share those lessons, and build that capacity um, within, the, within the region. So. Thanks very much. Um, and it's, it's a message of hope, really. I mean, if there's no um, magic in this, it means we can all do it. Right? And it means that we can all work on the similar constraints uh, at the national level, at the local level, along the lines of what you said. Yes, Minister, please. And that we still can achieve the 1.5 goal. <laughs> this is the other mm. element. I mean, we're st the small, the window is, is, is a small one, but we still can do it. <laughs> That's right. And um, Pierce told us that it is possible, provided we start fast and furious, essentially, right? Uh, we can't. Uh, we, we can't really relax on this one if it is to happen, right? Um, very well, very well. Thank you very much. Uh, and uh, let me now um, uh, bring us to our uh, third um, panel member here, uh, Vice Minister Nicolas Galarza Sanchez. Uh, he's the Deputy Minister of the Environment uh, of uh, the Republic of Colombia. And he collaborates as an affiliate scholar of the Urban Expansion Program of the Maron Institute in NYU. Um, so uh, he's an internationalist from uh, the Universidad del Rosario in Bogota, and he holds a master uh, in urban planning from NYU Wagner Graduate School of Public Service. Uh, he has led various projects in different cities of the region, uh, mostly focused on promoting orderly urban expansion. And uh, he's co-authored -author, uh, different publications, including the Urban Expansion Atlas of 2016 edition, and the Urban Expansion Atlas of Colombia. So he brings a, a wealth of urban experience to a, a topic where we know that cities play a key role, right? Uh, and we hope to hear some of that as we engage with you. So, um, Vice Minister uh, Correa Escaf, um, Colombia also submitted its second NDC at the end of 2020, uh, adopting an ambitious target to reduce emission by 51% compared 
to um, uh, uh, the previous level as the usual scenario. And my question is, considering where you are and the ambitious targets that you already have adopted, how much harder will it be for you to reach net zero by 2050? Can you tell us about the key principles and the factors that you had to consider for preparing Colombia's long-term strategy for 2050? Okay, thank you and greetings to my panelists and everyone present here. Uh, so that was a two-part question, how hard there yes. and uh, um, the factors that we consider. Uh, how hard there? Well, it's gonna be hard. You know, uh, we have to uh, acknowledge that, but that doesn't make it impossible. And uh, we need to remain uh, hopeful in many ways, particularly in space like this. You know, all the countries of the world come to uh, reach an agreement. And if we don't have a positive narrative, probably that's going to take a dent on the possibilities of reaching that agreement. Um, but we are committed. And I think that makes a lot of difference. We've uh, seen the leadership of different countries and we uh, decided to take uh, to take her own and uh, for that reason you you did mention that we updated our NDC back in December last year it seems like Grenada got us by a month uh, and um, that process was one that was really uh, thought uh, in terms of having the input of different uh, stakeholders. And uh, we made sure that we had a, a strong base and a strong participation for civil society. But we learned from the first NDC that this could not be done just by the environment ministry. And you know, our sector, and probably Minister Andrea would know that uh, oftentimes we find ourselves asking for a favor. And this is a, a, an utter misunderstanding of the work that we're doing. And I really like what Minister Mesa said, because this is not a strategy. This is the strategy. This is a transformation of the economy. And we cannot do that by ourselves. We need to engage the different sectors. Just going, uh, going to, 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 to uh, the question. So here we are after roughly uh, about a year of submitting our NDC, and we are taking a step further to elevate the commitments that we had. And in our NDC, we included uh, all sectors involved in the economy, as I'll, I'll, I'll uh, mention later, uh, with specific mechanisms and targets. So we can clearly expect the energy and mining sector to reduce at least 11 million tons. We know that from the AFOLU sector and the agriculture ministry, we can expect roughly 23 million tons of reduction. We know that deforestation is a big issue. In Colombia, deforestation produces the emissions, emissions that are threefold the global average. And we're really taking step on that. And, um, and uh, there are different principles that we created. We wanted to include a, a, a human rights approach, integrate the SDGs. And that was the first step, as you were mentioning. So what, what comes next is our strategy. So ye yesterday at the opening of the Colombian booth, you're all invited. It's just right, right across the hall down the alley. Um, we, we launched our E2050 strategy following uh, nine principles that outline really clearly the transformation that we are hoping to do. Uh, recently, we just had a panel at the, at the, uh, uh, where we had the Minister of Energy talking. We, we have a different figure. We have energy and mine in one sector, and, and we have environment in a different sector. And they were already showing the plan for carbon neutrality. So we understood that this was not something that we could do ourselves. But even though it's going to be far, f hard, the fact that we engaged different act actors and we requested, but worked jointly, uh, putting together plans, putting together targets, and putting together mechanisms, I think is gonna, is gonna help significantly. And that's, that's where, where we're at. So we know we're aiming high, but we also know that we need greater commitment. We saw the, uh, the global gap emissions report that we need that kind of went through 
all the MDCs, and even though we need at least a reduction of 45% of greenhouse gases, we're only getting uh, to 7.5. Uh, so Colombia is doing the share. Some other countries with amazing leaderships are doing the share, but we need more of that. And uh, we need to pass the narrative that this is hard. It's hard, but we are in a crisis. And nobody said this was going to be a fast undertaking, and we're, we're pushing forward. Thanks very much. Um, and it, it, it sort of begs the second question here, um, especially along the lines of what you have described as a, a declination of solutions across sectors, right? Um, how do you make that happen? I mean, we know it's hard to get different ministries to work together, right? It's hard to get different institutions to collaborate over issues that are integrated in nature, right? Over issues that uh, cannot be solved without that kind of collaboration. So um, let me ask you that question, and uh, maybe with the permission of uh, the two ministers, I would ask them the same question after that, right? Uh, how did you make it work, actually, to get to collaborative solutions where those um, silos sometimes are tough to overcome. I, I think they, I, I touched upon that briefly on, on the first part of the answer mm -hmm. that I gave, and that is something that I actually fought before joining as, as uh, uh, Vice Minister for the Environment. I used to lead the city uh, mm -hmm. program and the city right. department at the Ministry of Housing and Cities. And for a random reason, I ended up uh, being accountable for uh, the CO2 emitted by candles, which had nothing to do whatsoever with what we did, right? And uh, I, I started inquiring why, and it's funny because I started inquiring to the people I, I get to manage now, and, and they, they said, you know, we did that by ourselves. That was the first time around, the first NDC. And we, we learned the lesson. So, you know, this, is, this cannot be an imposition of some technical teams thinking, you know, well, people that do not have electricity, and uh, Demi Lola was talking about that, uh, and then that That's happens right. in houses, probably that should happen to the housing ministry. So it mm -hmm. cannot be random, it cannot be haphazard. And, uh, and that's how we, we started working with give, given sectors. I think it helps a lot, the fact that we had a climate a climate change law on 2018, uh -huh. which gave us a governance structure that is very well thought of. Mm. And looking back, of course, uh, I think it was it was good and it helped a lot uh -huh. for for this type for this type of exercise. We have an intersectoral commission, like a cross government uh, coordination section. The president is creating the climate change cabinet um, right now. Uh, but that was created thinking th through that law. I think it gave us the basis. We've seen different uh, legislation throughout uh, Latin America where, where they, they're kind of taking that step of creating the governance. Mm -hmm. And it, it might seem obvious and people might disregard it as bureaucracy, but it really helps. And it takes time for it to work, but now having this structure, uh, a, a dedicated liaison uh, on, on every, every government, and the mandate, which was, I think, a key innovation on the legislation of 2018, was demanding a comprehensive uh, management plan for each given sector to climate change. Hmm. So, the and, 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 and is, I think, inspiring the fact that the first, uh, and probably has a, 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 li a little bit uh, complicated to me, is the fact that the first uh, sector putting the, the comprehensive um, management plan for, for climate change was mining and energy. Hmm. And, and then when I joined, and when, when I was working at the housing ministry, I put out the second sectoral plan, the integral, the comprehensive uh, plan for climate change. And when I came to the ministry of, uh, for the environment, I was like, okay, where is my comprehensive plan? And, and we, we had an, the outstanding uh, task and, and we're working on it and we're, we're getting all the, gov all the other sectors to put the plan but that, that, that kind of stuff helps. So now what we're doing with the new law, with the, we had a climate change law, now we have a climate action law. And the fact that we had that helps us put specific responsibilities and specific targets. And I think that's the basis of uh, us thinking 
what we're doing. And I think something that needs to go further, and, and this, uh, with, with this I'll close, is engaging local governments. Of course, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm biased a bit because I come from the urban planning discipline, and, and I like to see cities engaged. And uh, in, in our MDC, we have 196 uh, mechanisms, and 89 come from cities. Mm. Yet, only five cities committed. So they're like, it's very concentrated in a group of people, a, a group of cities, and we know that that can be expanded. So when you think that Colombia has 1,100 municipalities, I think there's a lot of uh, uh, leeway there to, to get more reductions on the mitigation front. And it's going to be hard again, but I think we, we can do it. And, and, and having that kind of specific detail shows the way and helps a lot to move the narrative forward. Thanks very, very much. I, I'm really glad I asked that question. You gave us a lot. Uh, so um, a climate change law, a climate change action law, a steering committee across, uh, anchored at high level, right? It probably doesn't hurt that ministers are moving from critical sectors to critical sectors as well. Thanks very much. No, that's uh, extremely useful for others as well. Minister Meza, can I ask you the same question? Uh, wh uh, what is it that uh, uh, very much helped in bringing together uh, sectors bringing together ministries and institutions when we know that they are not necessarily prompted to work together very easily. Yeah? First, when you have a president with, who is committed, <laughs> this well, is very helps. important. Um, because um, I was the climate change director before um, being appointed as minister, and, and when we started with the previous government, for that president, it wasn't really a, a priority as it is for this president. So this has really um, facilitated a lot of this interaction. So you really need, you know, decision making, the high level champion there, <laughs> very committed and requesting for this. And then also to generate and understand that it's about co-benefits. It's about when we talk to the Ministry of Transport or to that sector, it's not about emission reduction. It's about uh, enhancing the transport sector, the public transport sector. It's about um, making the public buses a better system. So it's it's another conversation, and it's the same in agriculture. It's an, it's not about um, reduction emission reduction. It's about um, enhancing the way and productivity and delivering with this kind of notion. So it's about uh, enhancing also uh, the agricultural sector. So it is, I think, about a conversation of understanding that it's a transformation that can generate a lot of benefits. And if we can be very clear when we are having these conversations with the different sectors, then the conversation is uh, a lot easier. And the third component, I will say, it is mobilization of resources. <laughs> Right. At the end, this is the agenda that it is attractive to most of the donors and uh, for the cooperation um, community. So it's it's easier when you come with cooperation money and have this conversation with the different sectors. Mm -hmm. Thanks very much uh, uh, for your response. So you, you have to vote for the right president first. Huh? Uh, I gather it's uh, it's about high level leadership and making sure that. Uh, it comes from the top, right? Uh, so that that coherence can be pushed. Then through technical um, means uh, all across uh, the, the, the political and the uh, institutional spectrum. No, that's a very useful advice. Um, Minister, in Grenada, um, how um, have you dealt with this natural challenge um, of getting cooperation going and getting coherence in policies to take hold? Um, I think there are that there are four elements. So one is again, and this is a theme that's run throughout. It's about policies. So whether mm -hmm. it's your climate change policies, um, energy policies, etc. Uh, but there are common linkages um, between them. We have it's not a steering committee, but we have our national climate change committee, which is again, takes that whole of government approach as representation from all of the key ministries within that committee. Um, 
the committee has subcommittees to focus on, whether it's mitigation, adaptation, um, finance, other, um, other elements. But the cohesion and the, 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 the skill sets that exist within that committee are critical. So within that committee, um, we have visibility um, with the, the different ministries and the, the, the different sectors. So that provides real cohesion and, and, and oversight. Mm -hmm. um, the next piece is um, focal points, climate change focal points in each ministry. Mm -hmm. Some work better than others, um, but that is a way of, of having direct outreach again um, a, a across, across government. And then the final element um, is that we have introduced now as, as again, a matter of policy and um, climate screening in all of our program development. Mm. And again, that is across ministries. So um, as part of the program development process, the question of climate change, climate implications and climate appropriate climate responses is there as a hurdle, a reminder, a gate, a gate is probably a better word, mm -hmm. but a gate that, um, that, that, uh, that, that is used in that, 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 that decision-making process. So I think a combination of those things mm -hmm. helps to bring that, um, that, that kind of cross-cutting impact. Thanks, thanks very much. Um, it, it's, it's really interesting to, to, to listen to how uh, this uh, endeavor basically has changed the um, administrative practices, right? Uh, and uh, the types of conversation and the, and the anchoring of richer horizontal conversation across ministries. Uh, and just as, uh, if I heard you well, just as everybody was doing an economic analysis, everybody now will do a climate analysis to any future policy or investment approach. Yeah? Uh, no, that's extremely interesting. Now, we're coming uh, close to the end of this session, but I see a hand up with insistence, so I, I, I think we should allow two or three questions, not to delay you, but to make sure that the audience has a chance uh, to, um, to raise a question. So behind you, Filippo, please. Um, There's a gentleman. Yes, maybe you can hear me without the mic. Uh, no, we're, we're recording, so thanks. Sir. Mm. Sure, so I'm Saad from Morocco, a young uh, climate and young engage youth engagement activist. Uh, you spoke about the crucial role of uh, intersectoral uh, approach and collaboration. Uh, I would love to hear some lessons learned about engaging and ensuring buy-in of different stakeholders, especially the private sector and maybe community representatives. So who wants to take that question? A, a simple answer from me, you cannot do enough of it. Um, I think that's, that's the critical um, piece. It is engaging, engaging, engaging. Um, Grenada, we're, we're a small country, um, so we have, <laughs> we know one another. Um, sometimes we have consultation fatigue because again, it's some of the same faces that, um, that, 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 that you draw upon, whether that's in civil society, whether that's um, in, in the private sector. Um, but I would, the, the one point is you cannot do enough. I, since you asked about le lessons learned, something that we've done and that has been uh, to, to an extent surprising, uh, engaging particularly the private sector, was we, we launched a technical assistance program, assistance program to uh, the private sector in order for them to, to start the, the, road, the, the race to zero, if you, if you wanted to put it that way. And we started with a modest program, uh, hoping to have at least 50 companies joining and Colombia, as I think I mentioned, this is a bit unusual because the, the bulk of the greenhouse gas emissions are not coming from cities, but are also co are coming from the Afolu and the deforestation. Um, but uh, what we saw when we launched the program was that instead of having 50, we got 100. And uh, we got all sizes 
of, of companies, from the largest uh, electricity and mining companies, from uh, a company manufacturing screws at a very local level. And you could find different levels of engagement. Of course, the largest corporations have uh, developed a sustainability practice, so they surely uh, would have done that. Uh, uh, and so they are kind of finding the way to, to to do compensation, but they know what they need to do. And some other companies how, how are absolutely clueless about how much carbon they're emitting on their, on their value chain. So by launching the program with different uh, steps, let's say, and different layers of technical assistance, we are managing to, to, to get it more. And I, I mentioned it the other day also, but uh, recently we, we even got a company that including signing the carbon neutrality pledge in their advertising. And that connects to the second part of your question, which is uh, engaging uh, the community and youth. I think a lot that we need to do, and I echo uh, Minister Steele's uh, remark that you cannot do enough of that. And I think it, in a lot of uh, uh, scenarios, it goes to basic education. I think we, we are at COP, we are uh, an educated uh, crowd, yet, uh, I don't know how many of you have calculated the carbon, the carbon, uh, your carbon footprint, your individual carbon footprint. So you know th this is exactly the point that I wanted to make: is that you need to uh, to engage the people, show them that this is, you know, this this. We're not going to solve at the individual level if we bike to work every day. I'm I'm a, I'm a cyclist. I enjoy cycling at all, but I'm not I'm not naive. And, and we need to do that. We need to see how we're contributing to the problem and how the companies that we are uh, purchasing from are including sustainability in their practice, either the, the, the dairy that we eat, the meat that we eat, the clothing that we eat. And, uh, and, and, and for that reason, we also have a program, something this has been around for decades probably, but helping people to calculate their own carbon footprint and to create a plan to do compensation. So that, that level, we can engage different levels. Thank you very much. Uh, we can take one more question. Very well, please go ahead, sir. Thank you very much. Um, Spencer Thomas from Grenada. Um, we heard about the science and the urgency for action now and decisive action. When we look at the topic, we said net zero pathways. We're talking 2050 and it was aspirations. So my question is, how do we ensure that the, 20, the, the pathways of 2050 is not an incentive for action to not to take action now, and so that we will be able to, to meet the, 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 um, the, the 1.5? Thank you. Very good question that speaks to the point that the professor shared with us earlier. It's about the itinerary, not just the target. Uh, uh, Minister Meza, you volunteered for an answer. Thank you. I think it's critical to understand that um, we need to develop short, medium, and long-term measures that we need, when we develop these long-term strategies and these long-term goals, we need to develop the plan. And this plan must include measures in, this, in these aspects, which are the short-term measures the medium and long-term measures, and the investments that need also to be implemented in short, medium, and long-term. I think that this is the only way that we can really be seeing <laughs> the implementation of those long-term goals. Thank you very much, uh, Minister Meza. Um, well, um, I look at the time, and unfortunately, we have come to the end of this session. I, would, I cannot let you go without saying a few words about the Jeff the Global Environment Facility. We're here. Um, Carlos Manuel Rodriguez, who's our chairman and CEO, would have very much wished to be here with us. Uh, couldn't do it tonight. Uh, but uh, yeah, I, I think on his behalf and on behalf of the Jeff, a few words about how what we are seeking to do, what we're doing and what we're seeking to do um, uh, is relevant to some of what we've heard tonight uh, coming from countries and from science. Um, so we're, uh, uh, you probably know the Jeff if you're here, uh, our role is to be uh, the financial mechanism for the implementation of the Rio Conventions and beyond. Uh, and we've been for 30 years, as our lo logo indicates, in the business of making sure we 
we uh, channel grants to countries that have strategies and plans to make sure that uh, we collaborate in the direction of solutions on anything affecting global impact. Now, we're entering our eighth replenishment, uh, which should conclude uh, in the coming year, sort of mid-year, meaning that all countries will have a new envelope to work on those issues uh, by July of next year. And every time that replenishment happens, there is also a process of redefining strategies with science and technical advice, with countries and consultations, uh, and of course with donors who in the end contribute to that replenishment. And just to give you a few directions here of what is in the process of being discussed right now in terms of critical thematics, because it very much matches what we've heard tonight, right? Uh, so without getting into the details, I mean, there, uh, there's greater ambition in what we seek to do in, uh, in, uh, with finance first. Greater ambition on substance and greater ambition on finance because we're mindful of the gap and we know that even with the best solution, there's a financial gap to work on global issues and countries uh, rightfully expect uh, uh, higher flows. So we're working on that and we're very hopeful that, hopeful that together with mobilization of additional resources, better blending of resources, higher co-financing and uh, better alignment with public budgets, right? Uh, which uh, are the most uh, legitimate and the most uh, relevant leverage to any intervention, as well as with potential financing of the private sector, which uh, we're very much trying to find pathways for as well. Yeah? We can see greater flows. So that's one direction. The second direction is integration, and this is substance, right? By now, we know that. Uh, uh, integration yields much greater results than silo interventions. And that in fact, uh, in order to address the drivers of uh, uh, global environment de uh, 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 degradation in general and climate change in particular, we need that kind of integration. Uh, we will have climate change impact through projects that are initiated in agriculture or in forestry uh, or in cities. And uh, the more integrated, the greater results. So that's one big direction of uh, Jeff 8. Um, the third one you have amply talked about, it's the policy and institutional gap. It is the necessity to work on coherent policy. It's the necessity to get rid of negative investments uh, that result from not so coherent policies, right? It's about making sure that the various sectors contribute to an integrated solution instead of having partial solutions that don't amount to actual advances, right? So this issue of coherence of policies and coherence of institutions, I think we had the pleasure tonight to hear in a very hopeful way, right? How countries are dealing with it. And uh, I, I think it really aggregates to a message of hope to hearing you uh, tonight with your national examples, which is extremely encouraging. And the fourth direction uh, has also been mentioned by all of you, in fact, it is inclusion. It is doing this with the interested parties. It is bringing, um, uh, communities, bringing beneficiaries, bringing indigenous people, bringing uh, civil society in full alignment uh, with uh, uh, and, and giving them a voice, a chance to contribute. You mentioned it, uh, Minister, when you talked about Grenada, and uh, I think it's, uh, it's, it's uh, and it was mentioned as well, that, that you know, solutions that come bottom up have much greater chances of being implemented, right? So it's about finding processes where these conversations can happen. The GEF, of course, supports all of the above, and we support, uh, by our policy and by our practices, we support an inclusive process to come up with projects, to um, implement them, and to oversee their implementation. And so all of these dimensions that we discussed tonight, integration, greater financial ambition, policy and institutional coherence and alignment, and inclusion are dimensions that we're bringing to GEF 8, and we hope to contribute uh, uh, to play a role in uh, the facilitation of some of these hopeful process. I would like to thank particularly all of our um, uh, participants tonight for the capacity to collectively aggregate this conversation to a message of hope. I think it's very important when we talk about, when we talk about the targets, when we talked about the, the net zero, zero ambition, to actually focus on what can work, what has worked, and how to make it work. Uh, it's a real privilege for all of us to have had uh, the, the best part of your mind on this based on national experience, together with uh, science that believes that we still have a path. So thanks, uh, Professor, as well, for that. We very much appreciate your presence tonight. Uh, thanks for joining us. Thank you.